we make decisions emotionally. And if all we're doing is spouting features and benefits, we're really engaging the logical part of the brain. The logical part of the brain does not make decisions. Stories are about change. So every time we're listening to a story, what we're listening for is the change in the story. That's what makes the story the story. So every story has a beginning, a middle, and the end. And the middle is where the change takes place. The middle is always messy. The middle always has conflict in it. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's biggest B2B sales show, where we help you not just hit your sales target, but really thrive in sales. Let's meet today's guest. Hi, this is Adrian Davis on the Salesman Podcast. I'm the president of Whetstone Inc., where we help you win, keep, and grow key accounts. In this episode of Adrian, we're diving into storytelling in sales. And this is no ordinary salesman podcast because I personally took a ton away from this particular episode as you'll see as you go through it and we cover storytelling what you need to do before the story the discovery work you need to do there how you tell an emotional story that drags the reader the listener the viewer the person you're meeting with into it and then the logical steps you need to do to close the deal after the fact and so with all that said let's jump right in tell us why we need to use storytelling and how it perhaps can be a differentiator versus a com uh, our competitors who are just kind of spouting features and benefits over and over to uh, the audience, the, the prospects that we're all trying to communicate with. Yeah, well, huge differentiator. And I'd say fundamentally, we make decisions emotionally. And if all we're doing is spouting features and benefits, we're really engaging the logical part of the brain. The logical part of the brain does not make decisions. It, it analyzes and it, it captures information to weigh pros and cons, but decisions are made emotionally. And what stories do is they tap into the emotional center of the listener. And that's where the decisions are made. And we're gonna go slightly off tangent already here, but is there a balance between emotional and analytical selling, if we put it that way, that we need to to contemplate and think about in these conversations and stories? Is, is it kind of 50% one way, 50% the other, or is it dependent on the individual that we're speaking to? How does all this align up? I would say maybe I would use the word sequence rather than balance. Uh, we have to capture the emotions first. Once the, once the emotions are captured, then we need to feed the logic because the logic is what's going to be used to justify the decision that's made emotionally. And what I'll also say here, Will, is that stories are about change. So every time we're listening to a story, what we're listening for is the change in the story. That's what makes the story the story. So every story has a beginning, a middle, and the end. And the middle is where the change takes place. The middle is always messy. The middle always has conflict in it. And that's what we're listening for. And then as a result of that conflict or that, that mess in the middle, we want to know, okay, well, what's the outcome? Remarkably, when people buy from us, what they're buying from us is change. They're, they're in a particular situation, which is the beginning of their story. Uh, we call it the status quo. And they're unhappy with the status quo. There's, there's a threat in the status quo that if it's left un, untended, it could actually uh, be fatal. It could be catastrophic. So they need to do something to move out of the status quo to get to a better state. But they cannot do that without going through this bit in the middle, which is the messy bit, the, tran the transition state. And that's really where we help folks uh, get through that. And what does that look like, Adrian, from uh, whether it's an example from yourself, client, someone along those lines, what, what does a business story look like? And I, I guess as you're saying it, can you break it down into perhaps those three steps? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, what I would say is it, 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 we can break it down into five steps. It, it, it is still fundamentally the three steps, but from a sales story perspective, Will, uh, it, it's nuanced into five steps That's that I call, what should I say, I call, it's called the hero's journey. I've basically taken this, <clears throat> excuse me, I've taken this pattern or this framework called the hero's journey and just said like, wow, that is, that's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. We need to apply that to sales. And so I train uh, salespeople how to use this very simple framework called the hero's journey in their sales stories. So remember I said that uh, the, the framework of a story, every story is beginning, middle and end. And the, the messy bit is in the middle. Well, when you watch a movie, when you go to the theater, when you read a book, even if you listen to a, a cer certain songs, they will follow this pattern of the hero's journey. And it has five steps where in step one, we need to introduce you to the hero. And if you're watching a movie, they'll usually take the first 15, maybe 20 minutes getting you to buy the hero. Because if you don't buy the hero, the movie doesn't work. 
So everything that's going to happen to the hero later in, in the movie, if you don't buy the hero, the movie is boring. But if you think like, wow, this person's just like me. Uh, I'm like that. And I, you know, I, I can see how they care for their spouse. And I, I'm a caring person, too. Once that happens, then the movie's going to work. If it's a thriller, you're going to be thrilled because <laughs> you're, you're actually walking through the shoes of the hero. So step number one is introduce the hero. Once you introduce the hero, then step two is to introduce the villain. The villain now comes to challenge the hero and cause the hero's life to go poorly. And, and this is now where, this is what really makes the movie, is the conflict between the hero and the villain. That now moves to a state where the hero is in trouble. Uh, sometimes they are literally in a pit, but certainly figuratively, they're in a pit. And they can't get out. They're using all their, their strength and power, and they're just stuck. And the only way they can get out is if they acquire new strength or new wisdom. And so at this point in the movie, or at this point in the story, a new resource shows up and gives them a word of advice or gives them a sword that they can now use to fight back. They, they then now struggle and they now have triumph because they have this new strength. They're able to triumph over the villain and then there's transformation. So these are the five key steps of the hero's journey. There's the, the hero, the villain, the pit, the new resource that comes to the hero in the pit. They're able to fight back and triumph. And then there's the transformation. Those five steps still follow the pattern of beginning, middle, and end, where the beginning is the, the, the introduction of the hero and the introduction of the villain. The middle is this, this struggle in the pit where the, the, the hero can't get out. And then the end is the triumph and the transformation. This is an archetype that we are actually wired for. Our, our whole lives will follow this pattern of the hero's journey. Every single one of us is on a journey, and every single one of us encounters villains on this journey. And then we need help in order to overcome the villain. And so this is something that we're actually wired to listen for. And that's why these movies, books, theater, music, it all works because once this pattern is engaged, our brain recognizes it subconsciously. So I've got an example of this that I'm literally doing right now and promoting as this podcast episode comes out. And I just touched on it briefly, Adrian, with you before uh, we click record. And so I'll just give you a, a bit more of a picture to it because you can then help me because I'm missing a few steps in the story that I'm telling uh, through the sales school. So we have these characters. One of them is Sam. He is the average salesperson. That Sam was me kind of five, six years ago doing okay medical device sales, but not really crushing it. Sam lives in this crazy world. He's, his sales manager is a complete arsehole. The CEO of the company is based on Elon Musk. He's an absolute baller. He's doing all these crazy stuff. He's filthy rich, but he's a, a innovator at heart as well. There's marketer doing the you know, typical marketing things that we all know and love that it, the, as they're clashing with sales. So there's this little world that he's in and we kind of go through some of the concepts in the sales school, such as influence um, and the persuasion side of things and all the, the the mission on kind of aligning sales and marketing and all these different things are all confuddled within these stories. Now, something I'm missing within this is Sam seems to be always fighting, but never really having a transformation. So maybe this comes further down the line. I don't know. But as you go through this archetype, it seems pretty easy to come across. So sell, say we're selling to a CEO, we can find within our previous series of customers, there's a CEO that aligns up nicely with the organization. Perhaps, hopefully, it's a competitor that you've worked with and, and done well for. So they go, oh, heck, if the competitors are competition and doing it, we're going to have to do it as well. So we have the the individual. What would be, and the answer, the answer you might have already answered this, it might be status quo, but what, what would typically be the villain in that scenario if we're selling some kind of a, a software product, for example, if we know the CEO... Um, we've matched the, the individual we're telling the story to, but this one they can relate to. What would be the villain in that scenario? Okay, so let's, let's just back up a little bit. Um, that's a great, great uh, situation there, by the way. And I thought you were going to ask me a slightly different question, but let us uh, let me just back up a little bit. So first of all, what I said earlier was that uh, people buy change. And so if you're selling to me, the reason I'm meeting with you is I want change. There's something going on today in my situation that isn't working and is quite threatening, and I know it needs to be addressed. And so I need to move from my current state or status quo into a future state. So that's, that's number one. Number two, as you meet with me, you have to uncover, you need to be very clear about two things before you tell your story. Number one is what is my role? 
So if I'm the CEO or if I'm a sales manager or if I'm a salesperson, uh, be very clear about the role that I occupy. And then number two, what is my goal? So it doesn't make sense just to tell stories if you don't understand the goal of the listener. You have to uncover the goal because the goal is really what makes the connection to emotion. Goals are emotional. If, you, if you're a sports fan, whatever sport you're watching, it's a very emotional uh, contest. And if your team scores, you're thrilled. If, you're, if your team, if, you're, if the opponent, opposing team scores, it's, it's devastating. Um, and so you see how emotional people are be, around sports because every sport is tied to a goal, whether it's putting a puck in a net or a soccer ball or a football uh, across the line, whatever, whatever the situation is, there's a goal. And so it's very emotional. So who are you talking to? The role will ensure that your story is relevant. And then what is their goal? to ensure that your story is emotional. Once they've shared with you the goal, then you can launch the story. So before I answer your question, let me ask you, who is it that you're selling to? What is their role? What is their goal? So uh, we'll continue with the sales school example. I'm selling to B2B sales uh, professionals who are sick and tired of uh, uh, traditional sales training, not working, people coming in to the organization once, twice a year, and it not sticking as kind of countless data on that that we, we included in the in the kind of sales school uh, marketing. And they're looking for a transformation. They're looking to improve themselves so that they can both thrive in sales now and then become uh, lined up and, and skilled up to become sales managers and leaders and, and kind of move out, move on throughout their career. Okay, so in, in my case, then let's say I'm in I'm in sales and uh, I'm okay, I'm doing okay, I, I like the job, but I'm struggling, I'm not really, I'm not knocking it out of the out of the park, and so you're uh, you you would be selling to me, so what you would have to un uncover my goal and say my goal is I want to you know I want to have a thriving career in sales and you know I want to be in the president's club I want I want people to look up to me and admire me and I'm tired of being average, so you'd say great. The way you would begin the story then, and, and what I said is it has to, you, they have to buy the hero. Hollywood will take 15 to 20 minutes to sell us their hero. We don't have that. We have 15 to 20 seconds. And so what I like to do is uh, train people to simply use two words to sell their hero. And so you would say something like, so I've shared with you the story and I'd say, you know, Will, what you've just shared with me reminds me of Fred. So it's very important that the hero is a person with a name, <clears throat> excuse me. And some people work in um, confidential industries. And so you have to make sure you have permission to, to tell the story. And then you may say, reminds me of Fred, not his real name, but he's given me permission to tell the story. So what you said re reminds me of Fred. Like you, these are, these are the magic words, like you. Like you, he is also a sales professional. And like you, he wanted to be top of the class. He wanted to be the, you know, somebody that everybody looks up to. So right there in that 15 to 20 seconds with the simple words like you, I have sold you the hero because anybody who's like you must be a good person. You're a good person. If somebody's like you, they must be a good person. And, and it's the same role. So you're a sales professional. This person is a sales professional. That makes it relevant. And they have the same goal. So whenever, when everybody, somebody has the same goal as us, we want to hear that story because whatever <clears throat> trials or misfortunes or triumphs they've had along the way, we want to know about that because it's going to help us guide our, our, our lives. So just in that 15 to 20 seconds, you've sold the hero. Now you need to introduce the villain. The villain is the threat in the status quo. So if I'm selling to you and I want you to uh, you know, engage in our sales school, I need to motivate you to take action. And a lot of people will hear, you know, that sounds really interesting. I'm kind of interested, but I don't take action. So the way to get you to take action is to tr trigger the threat response. You need to realize that if you sit where you are and you don't move, you could be in trouble. And so the way that I introduce wh whoever, I, when I introduce my villain in the story, the villain that I'm introducing is actually the threat in your current state. So I'm telling you about Fred. <clears throat> There's a part of your brain that couldn't care less about Fred. It doesn't even, does, it doesn't even know who Fred is, yeah. and, and it couldn't care less. So whenever I'm talking about Fred, that part of your brain will convert the story to, to Will's story. So it, it'll, it's always about you, and it will con any, everything I say about Fred is going to convert it to, to you. So I know that, but I'm just going to tell you about Fred. So I tell you, you know, you remind me of Fred, the sales professional like you, and also wanted to be top tier. 
wanted to be somebody that everybody looks up to. I introduced the villain with a single word. That word is unfortunately. Because we're wired to know that whatever comes after the word unfortunately is bad news. So, you know, so suddenly, you know, this person, you remind me of Fred. He's a sales professional like you, top-notch guy, and wanted to be top tier, wanted everybody to look up to him, really wanted to crush it in his career. Unfortunately, he had a really demanding sales manager. And he just, you know, average just wasn't good enough. And this sales manager, every year, he would cut 10% of the sales force. And unfortunately, it looked like this was going to be uh, Fred's year to be fired. And, you know, he's, he's, he's trying to make, he's doing his best. And he's just, no matter what he's doing, he can't succeed. And uh, it came to the point where he was weeks away from being fired. Even though I'm talking about Fred, there's a part of you that begins to wonder, are you going to be fired? What's, what's your sales manager like? Is your sales manager running out of patience? But I'm just telling you about Fred. And now I can actually build on that. You know, hopefully I've actually spoken to Fred and he shared with me what was going on. And, I, you know, he had a mortgage, he had car payments, he, he was thinking of getting married. And now he's on the verge of losing his job. And he's, you know, he's middle aged. And, and if he loses his job now, it's going to be really difficult to get back into the market. And while I'm saying all of this about Fred, you're actually feeling it. Right? You're, there's a part of your brain that's translating all of this to your situation. And what I'm really doing is I'm selling against the status quo. I'm basically saying to you, you can't stay still because people are watching you. They have expectations. And, uh, you know, you, you, you miss your number again for another month or another quarter. Your head could be on the chopping block. And so, you know, Fred's blood pressure was going up. He was starting to get into a difficult situation with his, his spouse or his girlfriend. He was becoming unreasonable. To, he's just very high, high strung. Then I introduced the special resource. And this is where salespeople, we, we just need to get better at this. We always want to be the hero. So most of our, <laughs> most of our presentations, our PowerPoints, when we're talking about ourselves, we talk about ourselves as if you know, we are the ones that will come in and save the day. We cannot do that. Uh, it, the life doesn't work this way. That what, what, what we can do is we can enable, we are enablers. We can enable people to fix their problems. Uh, we can enable people to solve their, their problems. And so the role that we play in somebody's story, because I'm even though I'm telling you about Fred and how we helped Fred, I realize that I'm stepping into your story. And the role that I can play in your story is not to be the hero in your movie. You know, nobody wants to be in a movie where somebody comes in and takes over. You know, it's like, uh, you know, this is Will, Will's story starring Adrian. No, it's, uh, it's, it's your story. So uh, we introduced ourselves into the story and we simply say with the word fortunately. So we introduce the villain with the word unfortunately. We introduce ourselves with the word fortunately. Fortunately, you know, we met at a trade show. Fortunately, somebody referred him to speak to me. Uh, fortunately, he was doing a Google search and he found me, found us. Uh, we, we spoke and we worked together. So it's just the word fortunately to bring us into the story, and we worked together. That's all we say. We don't say that, you know, we went in and we saved the day. We worked together, and as a result, he was able to. And this is really important, and this is where most stories fail, is we want to be the hero. No, we worked together, and as a result, he was able to become much more competent, much more disciplined in how he went about the sales process. And he began to realize that sales is a process and began to engage his prospects in a much more disciplined and much more effective way. And then I say, and now, and this is how I'm gonna end the story, and now. And this is really the critical part. So uh, unfortunately was the current state and it was the threat in the current state. And now is I'm pointing to the future state. So we want to move from current state to future state. I'm going to say, and now, uh, Will, or Fred, and now Fred, is the number one salesperson in his company. His manager is constantly telling the other reps to look at how Fred goes about his day, look about how Fred goes about his accounts, always ask Fred's to come in and do lunch and learns and explain to the others how he's won a particular account. And he's actually now... Uh, about to be promoted to become sales manager or whatever the case is. But whatever I say after and now, this is the current, this is the new current state for Fred. It's his present, but it's your future. It's what you're hoping 
will happen for you in the future. I'm telling you that somebody's enjoying this today. And now this is what Fred has. And this is what you're hoping for. So in that little story, I'm able to address the current state and the threat in the current state. I'm able to address the future state and the promise of the future state. And I minimize the transition state. That, that state in the middle, which is really messy, I minimize that. I simply covered it over with we worked together. So I came into the story, we worked together, and now Fred is off to the races, right? So if the story lands, if it works, Will, the listener will come, will, will say, well, can you tell me a bit more about how you worked together? And then I can elaborate on the sales school and how it works, et cetera. You, Adrian, are going to laugh your head off when you see the sales school. I'll send you a link because I'm literally going to rewrite the homepage based on this conversation. And every, or the audience who listen to the show who see the marketing for it as well will laugh their heads off because Sam, in the context of the sales school, and it still works because it's it's humorous, the mishaps that he gets into, and that kind of adds an entertainment value to the content itself. But the overarching story should be, well, is missing kind of three of the steps here of, in the sales school, he's always messing up and there's this and he's working hard and the audience can relate to him and he's the sane person in this insane world that he's working within. But he doesn't find the resource. <laughs> and, and the resource he should be finding is the sales it's the school. Sales school. Yeah. Exactly. This is brilliant. Exactly. So then, exactly. And, and I like the way, and you, you worded it very carefully here of, uh, along the lines of you, you minimize the messy bit. Because that was the thing, as you were first going through this, that I was struggling to get my head around of is, do we dive into that? Do we kind of start raising the, the how difficult it was and we help them with this? But as soon as we make the other person the hero, we don't have to do any of that, right? That 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 complicated part of the story doesn't get glossed over, but just gets short. I think you used the word shortened as well. I, I love that. Yes. That's fantastic. And it really is, uh, op in the grand scheme of things, it's insignificant. It's significant, but it's insignificant. What is significant is right now you're losing right now things are not going well for you and you're worried and that can all turn around you can actually be the opposite you can be heroic you can be empowered you can be crushing it and so that's that's the significance of the story you can go from losing to winning and i'm going to create a little bit of intrigue by saying i stepped into the story whispered something in the hero's ear uh, gave them a shiny new sword and they were off and now they're having triumph that bit of intrigue by not giving too much away actually invites curiosity for the and, and that's how you know that you actually won the, the the prospect over when they lean forward and say can you tell me more about how you worked with fred what what exactly did you guys do once that question is asked I know that the prospect has actually bought. Emo they've emotionally engaged. And now, now we're going to work with somebody. And that's why I said it's not so much balance, it's sequence. Win the emotional uh, fight first, engage them emotionally first, and then you can give them the logic. So once they come forward and say, can you tell me more about how you worked with Fred? Okay, now we're going to give you some logical information and ammunition because we know what you bought emotionally. So I want to come back to the next step of the logic element of this in a second. But there's something that I scribbled down here and I don't want to gloss over. And this might be just as important as the story itself. And it's something I've never really contemplated for before uh, within the context of storytelling within sales. And that is, do we go into a conversation having a hypo hypothesis of what the person's problem is and then we throw a story at them and hope it sticks? Or does this come further down the line after we've asked them a few discovery questions and we know what they need, what their problems are and how we can potentially resolve them. And then we present that to them in a story. Absolutely. So in my book, Human to Human Selling, I actually show the pattern. The pattern is discovery first, then the story. And it has to be a particular type of this discovery. I, I focus, as you know, on C-level selling. And so taking folks who are uncomfortable selling to the C-suite and making them very competent and very comfortable doing that. Um, but when we're selling to executives, it's all about strategy. So it's not just any goals. We have to understand their strategic goals. And so I have a discovery framework, uh, Will, that I've developed that really uh, gets into having a conversation around strategy and around strategic goals, then drilling down to the specific problem area, what's going on today, where, where can we help? And once we've uncovered that, then that's what sort of we transition with, oh, you know, what you shared with me reminds me of Fred. So it is that discovery process that comes first. And it's once we once we hear the goal, 
and we understand what it is they're trying to accomplish. Once we understand the, the, the threat in the current state, so it's that combination of uncovering the goal and the threat in the current state, you know, their hopes and their fears, that then we say, oh, you know, what you've shared with me reminds me of John or reminds me of Fred or reminds me of Sue. And then we're able to, we speak the story into their goals. We don't just speak stories. Oh, let me, let me throw this story at you and hope it works. It's really, I, I've heard what your goal is. I know what the threat you're concerned about is. This reminds me of, and I share this goal. What would be an example of a question that we can ask to uncover someone's problem that they're having acutely right now, rather than just a more wishy-washy question, which could lead to a mountain of problems that may never actually get resolved because they're not priorities? Right. Uh, so this is really good in terms of prioritization and, and understanding strategic goals is what makes the current problem a priority. So, so it's this combination of uncovering the strategic goal, uncovering the operational issue, linking the two. That's what makes the operational issue a, a priority because it has strategic implications and it could create strategic vulnerability. But I would say in a nutshell, uh, the question that you're asking, and, and I'm just going to give you a very, very basic question, because this is the fundamental question when we're trying to get at operationally what's wrong. It's the question is, is, what is happening now that should not be happening? And that's it. So, so there's something happening now that shouldn't be happening. What is that? But when we're able to uncover that in the context of the strategic goal, and then get them to understand the implications of this thing happening that, that shouldn't be happening, the strategic implications of that, that's what gives it a, pri a priority level. And, and what's the follow-up question to go from, we've uncovered a potential problem here, how do we then get them to think about it at a strategic level, perhaps if they haven't done already? Perfect, perfect question. So the methodology, the framework that I've uh, developed for executive discovery is the acronym ASAIL. A-S-A-L-E. A stands for amenity questions, where we, we need to be comfortable. You and I need to have a bit of rapport, have things in common. The, you need to be comfortable. Whenever we come into somebody's presence for the first time, or somebody comes into our presence for the first time, well, the subconsciously there's a threat response. We, we don't know if this person could harm us. So until we're comfortable with someone, we're sort of on, on guard. So it's important to bring that threat response down, especially if we're meeting someone for the first time. So amenity questions just create comfort, find common ground, build some rapport. Then instead of getting into the discovery of, you know, what are the challenges you're facing and how can I help? Uh, because people know that you're trying to sell them if you go straight there. Instead with executives, where we go is we go to what I call the S, the strategic context questions. We wanna ask questions and, and uh, talk with people at a high level uh, to understand their strategy and where are they taking the company in the next three to five years? What, what are their strategic goals? From there, we transition to the A, which is attention focusing questions. And here in attention focusing, we're trying to focus their attention on the part of the business where there's a problem where we can help. So we want to understand them strategically, but then we want to understand them operationally in the area of the business where we can help. That's the A. The L stands for linkage. And the linkage question is critical. It simply is the question along, along these lines, what does whatever we were talking about, in this case, you know, a salesperson who's not hitting, hitting their numbers or a sales team that's not hitting their numbers, what does, how does that relate to the strategic issues we were talking about earlier? So earlier you said, for example, it's your strategy to be number one in, all the, 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 in the three markets that you play in. And now we're talking about sales team not hitting their numbers. Can you share with me what the sales team's lack of performance, how does that relate to your strategic goal of being number one in the three markets that you're playing in? And let them answer the question. We're just asking them to connect the operational issue they're having to their strategic goals. Why? Because strategic goals are around desire. It's something that they want. Operational issues have to do with fear. Something's going wrong. We want them to connect fear and desire. We want both of these emotions, fear and desire, to, in, to, to, to agitate them. And then we know that they're emotionally engaged and that's sort of softening them up so that the story is going to be most effective. And then finally, the E stands for envisioning, where we just want to now take the fear and flip it around and ask them, you know, what does success look like? 
in, in a perfect world, what would that look like? And so we want to now get them to get the other side of the fear to turn that into a, a positive emotion. And it's having that conversation, we then say, oh, you know what? What you've shared with me reminds me of, and we move into the story. And now the story is really going to work because we, we're, we're very specific. We've got the goal and we've got the fear or the, or the threat. The, the reason I ask this is we've covered stories in the past, but we've never really had a setup for a story. And if you go through those pro process or those steps of a, a sale as you outlined them then, and I'll stick these in the show notes as well for everyone who's trying to scribble this down and kind of running on a treadmill and nearly falling over looking down at the phone. I'll put it in the, in the show notes. I'll make some notes on it. But you're, you're almost teeing them up. You're getting them, how to describe it, you're almost getting them uh, lit up and engaged and the, the tinder's already burning before this like fire flame comes over with the, the story and really just smashes it and paints this real picture in people's minds, right? Exactly right. And also, there's, there's also this other dynamic, Will, of um, if I'm full, I can't receive anything else. It's just going to bounce off me. So you need them to sort of empty their cup first. And so when they're talking to you, they're going to enjoy it because they're and, and they, you know, they're, they're sounding intelligent and they're sharing with you how they think and you're respecting the, the answers that you're hearing. And by the time they've had this part of the conversation, they've emptied their cup and now they're ready to receive from you. So now when you speak the story, they actually have a container that they can they can house the story in. So this is there's that dynamic as well. It makes total sense. And because we could probably go through those steps in detail and have a, a seven hour workshop on this. But I want to come back to the the end of the the story of where we perhaps turn this from an emotional kind of two, three, four, five minutes into now a logical conversation. Is there a way to make that transition? And then once we've made it, what are we trying to get out of the the, the prospect when we're asking them questions or when we're giving them logical facts? What what's the, What are we trying to if the if we're trying to empty them, then fill them up with a story and get them uh, emotionally bought in. What's the next? What's the transition? And then what's the goal in the next step? Okay, so normally I'm dealing with people who are selling complex solutions. Well, so I'm meeting now with the kind of key stakeholder here. Uh, we're having this strategic discovery session where they're sharing with me what it is they're trying to achieve and where they want to where they want to take the company and some of the things that are challenging them. I've listened to that. I then give them uh, a little preamble, a little hero's journey story to basically demonstrate to them the very specific things that you're sharing with me. We have already helped people who like you, who are facing very similar things, and now look at the success they're having. That then turns them on. The objective of turning them on is to do deeper discovery, because in these complex sales, one person doesn't make the decision. Multiple stakeholders need to come together in order to uh, give that go ahead that, yes, that they're, they're going to, uh, you know, uh, go forward with a complex solution. So what I want from this after we've had this meeting is I want permission or sponsorship to go and meet with the other stakeholders and do a deeper discovery with them. So that's that's my objective coming out of this key stakeholder meeting is that I get sponsored to meet with the other stakeholders. When I meet with the other stakeholders, I'm doing a couple of things. One is I'm building relationships. So I don't want to be this strange foreign entity. I want people to know who I am, know who my company is, and be comfortable with us. So I'm going to meet with these key stakeholders to build rapport and have a bit of relationship with them and get them comfortable with, with our ideas and our solutions. Number two, I want to hear how they perceive the challenges and the problems from their perspective. It's one thing to hear the key stakeholders say, well, you know, this is what this means and this is what it could uh, cost us, et cetera. But each department head has their nuanced perspective of the situation and what's wrong in the history, et cetera. So I want to uncover all of that. And number three, and, and this is where I think a lot of people miss the boat, uh, Will, is we need to uncover the financial implications of the problem. So as I'm meeting with these executives and very early on in the process, I want them sharing with me, what is this problem costing them? So I can now, and this is part of the logical, uh, when we get to proposal writing, we've got to give them the logic. They've already made the emotional decision. And I want to share with you a, a quick story, uh, how I kind of, looking back, I stumbled through in, into storytelling. Um, but we, we want to win them over emotionally. We have to win them over emotionally. Once we've won them over emotionally, we then need to give them the logical ammunition to proceed. So when I come back now and it's time to put a proposal together, I can show them that, let's say, the million dollars that they're going to spend with me, it's going to actually save them $10 million a year. 
And that $10 million, I didn't make this number up. I met with Fred, I met with Sue, I met with John, and I met with Jane. And these are the numbers they gave me of the challenges that they're facing, how many deals they lose, or how many invoices go out the door incorrectly, or uh, customers who don't pay. And I'm able to, to calculate all those numbers. And the number that I get when I put in their numbers is $10 million a year. And, you know, two million from Fred, three million from Sue, a million and a half from Jane. These are their numbers. And I'm able to consolidate them now and say, this is costing you $10 million a year. And this is the logical part of the argument that, that, that you know, if they don't buy emotionally, they're, they're not going to buy. It, you know, I can throw all the numbers at them that, they, that I like. It's not going to move them. They have to be moved emotionally. And then once they're moved emotionally, they, they need support to say, why are we doing it? Why do I want to do this? And so they're looking for justification. That's where that comes in. I did say just quickly, I wanted to share with you this story. Um, when I uh, started selling really complex software, multi-million dollar software, uh, I, I joined this company and it was during the internet uh, boom. And I nearly didn't take the job because their biggest competitor was in Toronto, where I would be as a single guy. And we were, this was a Silicon based, Silicon Valley company. And I just thought, you know, their executives, the R&D, the engineers, everybody's in Toronto, this is crazy. Anyway, I took the job. And uh, when I went to the sales conference, I just met the sales guys, people like yourself, and I just asked them one question, where have you been successful? And they would tell me, and I just made a, a, a list of stories that they, where they were successful. I came back from that conference with about 35 success stories. These were not my stories, they were their stories. And just intuitively, I didn't really, uh, there was no science here, it was just intu intuition. Whenever I would go on a sales call, I would look at my list of 35 stories and see which two or three stories might be relevant to this particular prospect. And then I would just commit it to memory, go into the meeting and just find a, a way somehow in the meeting, during the meeting, to, to just refer to one, two or three of these stories. And it just worked like a charm. In, in, in one particular case, there was a decision that was being made. The company was called Sprint Canada and they were buying a new billing system. It was a, multi, it was a $4 million deal. And I just got a call from a partner to say, Adrian, Sprint Canada is about to make this billing system decision. You guys need to get in there. So I called up the CIO and Willie wouldn't talk to me. He's just like, no, we've made up our mind. We're, we're good. Thanks. Yeah. We know about you guys. We've made up our mind. I was flabbergasted. I was like, how could it be? I didn't, I had no idea that we're making this decision. We were pretty good in terms of intelligence, but I had no idea. I called the CEO and I told her, you know, you guys are on the verge of making a multi-million dollar decision and you've never spoken to us. And one of, we're one of the leading vendors in this space. All we want is half an hour just to talk to you. And you make your decision, that's fine, but at least you've spoken to us. So she agreed and she brought in the VP of marketing. And before I go into the meeting, I saw we were successful at Sprint, U Sprint America, Sprint USA. And so I got that story and uh, went into the meeting and just in the meeting, uh, listen to her, same, it was the very same process to what I shared with you, except that I didn't have the science then, it was just uh, intuition. I was uh, learning to sell strategically. I was learning to, I was very curious about strategy. And so she shared with me what their strategy was, where they were going, what they were trying to accomplish. And then I got to understand how the billing, the internet-based billing, that flexible ability to, to invoice flexibly uh, would be strategically important to her. And then I shared with her the story of Sprint US. And like, it was amazing. So they were like moments away, maybe weeks away from signing this multi-million dollar contract. She put the whole project on pause. That CIO ended up getting fired. Uh, looks like there was some underhand, under the table dealings, I don't know what, but he got fired. Within four weeks, we won that deal. We went from being nobody, nowhere on the radar, Within four weeks, we had a four million dollar deal that was supposed to go. I'm sure the other salesperson had already, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. cashed their commission yeah. check. Um, but that was a like to me, looking back now, I understand why it was so powerful. And in that 30 minutes, a high level CEO made the decision to buy from us on the strength of the story of what we did with their with their counterpart in the US. And and so it's just I just thought I'd share that with you just to say and, and the audience just to say people can make big, huge, multi-million dollar decisions in a moment if they're engaged emotionally. And then everything you do after that is just feeding them the logical support they need to justify that feeling of want and desire that they have. Love it. 
what a what a perfect way to almost wrap up the show. And there's one thing, uh, one follow up question I've got from from that story, Adrian, and that is, what does this look like day to day for the audience here, with regards to creating stories and building them? Is this a we carry a notebook around with us and we jot down the rough outline of stories when we hear them? Is it we ring up our sales colleagues and our team, even though we're it's sometimes a weird competitive landscape with the people that you're selling on the same team with, where you're competing against. Do we ring these up and say, hey, have you got any good stories on X, Y, Z? Or is this something that we need to go, hey, sales manager, you need to, one, listen to this episode of the show, two, hire Adrian and read his book on the back of all this, and then get the sales manager to start collaborating some of this and and to build, I guess, a playbook. What What strategy do we need to kind of like day one start with on this? Yeah, so, so day one, I would say every salesperson out there, every salesperson listening to this podcast, just get started right away. Uh, if you if you had success, unless you're like brand new to the company, you've had some success with the company that you're in, go back and, and, and interview those customers and find out, you know, what were they going through? What were they thinking? Uh, what was going on in their world prior to you showing up? What were they worried about? Then talk about, you know, how are things now and what difference have you made for them? And just and your folks can uh, write to me and, and get a, a framework that I can give them a framework for the story, uh, the hero's journey story framework. Uh, and then and just start filling that in. And I would say you need in every industry. What I've found, Will, is there's probably two or three key goals of certain players in the industry. So if you're, if we, you know, we, we sell to VPs of sales, let's say. Uh, so the VPs of sales within a certain industry, there's two or three things that they're trying to do. You need to then find stories that speak to those two or three goals. So your stories need to be categorized by, by goal and by role. So just go back, where have I been successful? Let me take those successes and put them in this hero's journey framework. And you only need two or three to get started. And just just make them comfortable that they come off the tongue very comfortably. You could just be talking to you know, oh, you know, well, what you shared with me reminds me of Fred, like you, and you're just able to tell the story very naturally. Uh, so do that right away. I would say, having said that, every organization needs to realize that this, your success stories are a very powerful asset. And so the sales manager, the sales leader should actually make this a formal thing where let's just uh, house these stories, put them in a central repository somewhere that people, you know, hey, I'm selling into the telco space and I'm speaking to a VP of marketing. Do I have anything that's specific VP of marketing and telco? Oh, yeah, there it is. And, 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 and share these assets that way. It makes all sense. And I guess I'll be more overt about this. I, I kind of framed up that question in that all our content is for B2B sales professionals. I know there's a lot of leadership listening, and this just seems like a total no-brainer to have, even if it is just a Google Doc where everyone has one story that they add it every six months, and that builds up on a team of 30 salespeople to 80 stories over the, the kind of next 12, 18 months or so. It seems like a real interesting document that then you can go and, as you said, do interviews with these individuals, pull testimonials from it. If you get a referral, that can go in there. This person loved us so much that they referred two customers after the fact. And it seems like it's almost a living document that is then super appropriate to be, uh, and, and super, super updates to be sharing with individuals. It's not like, you know, Bob, the dude who quit the company 20 years ago, who did the biggest deal, we're still sharing his stories. Just a simple spreadsheet the whole team can add on to, a uh, simple uh, kind of G G doc it solves all these problems. I think that's really powerful. And yes, yeah, sales sales leaders listening to this, I think it's a no brainer for you to do that. And with that, yeah, Adrian, don't 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 overcomplicate it. No, no, of course. And and with that, Adrian, I've got one final question, mate. I'm pretty sure I asked you this last time we 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 chatted, and that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? Uh, if I could go back in time and speak to my younger self, I would say. Uh, don't be wrapped up in yourself. Be wrapped up in your customer's world. Get, you know, don't be self-centered. Really, truly be empathetic. Climb into your customer's shoes, walk in their shoes, see the world through their eyes. And the, the more you can do that, uh, the more successful you're going to be. And I think we, we, are, we limit our success when we're thinking about our commission, we're thinking about our situation. Uh, it, it just it limits our success. It limits our effectiveness. So really, truly be empathetic. Perfect. And that, this is a lesson that I'm constantly learning. And I, it seems almost counterintuitive at first that the more value you put out there without thinking about yourself, the more cash you get back rather than trying to be selfish. And 
it's it's something that I, I get hit on the head with every time I do anything, launch a new product, service, whatever it is. As soon as I stop thinking about myself and how many hours sleep I'm going to get each night, everything just makes way more sense and, and always comes in. And um, I don't think there's a kind of a law of attraction or anything pulling on it. It's just the, the world kind of working in your favor. So with that, Adrian, tell us where we can find out more about you, sir, and the book as well. Yes, certainly. You go to my website, adriandavis.com, adriandavis.com. The book is on Amazon. And uh, I would say if people want some help with this, uh, I do have a framework that I've developed that makes it very simple to record these stories. They can just write to me at adavis, A-D-A-V-I-S, at whetstoneinc.ca. That's W-H-E-T, stone, I-N-C, dot C-A, adavis at whetstoneinc.ca. And I'll also share with them uh, some questions as well to, to have that executive uh, conversation, of the, the discovery conversation prior to telling the stories. Perfect. Well, make use of that sales nation. Be emailing and pestering Adrian for these uh, this, this content. <laughs> and with that, mate, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I want to thank you for your insights. Everything that we talked about will be in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org. And with that, Adrian, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Will. Always a pleasure to be with you. 